that you've done this day. Lord, I don't want anything that I say or do to get in the way of you. So, Lord, hide me behind the cross so that as your people look, they will see Jesus. Lord, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. Lord, you are my strength and you are my redeemer. In Jesus' name, amen. If you have your Bible, I want you to turn to Romans, the fifth chapter. I'm going to read verses six through nine. At your leisure, you can read <coughs> six through ten, I'm sorry. At your leisure, you can read the entire chapter of Romans chapter 5. It's all going to constitute the context from where we're coming, but due to limitations in time, we're only going to focus our spotlight, sermonic spotlight, on these few verses, verses 6 through 10. When you're founded, if you do me a favor, stand to your feet so that, so that I'll know that you're there, and if you're not looking, stand anyway in honor of the Word of God. And the word of the Lord reads from the King James Version. Mine may differ from what you have, but if you read silently as I read aloud, we should get greater understanding. The word reads, For when we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will no one die. Yet preadventure for a good man, some would even dare to die. But God commanded his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. We're going to just tag this text with the topic of relationship with God. You may be seated in the presence of God in this assembly. I've got about 20 minutes to really try to initiate this. Uh, this is about maybe 40 minutes worth of information. Uh, so I'm not going to try to finish it. Uh, you know how I am when it comes to time. I want to give you what I think you can handle within the time frame I think we can handle. So we will be getting out on time. But I want to lay a foundation uh, for this series that we're going to be doing, which is the relationship series. I um, do want to acknowledge Brother Willis, who's in the house with Solomon. Um, I, had to, I went to visit him this week, and we didn't know if he would be here today, we, but he, he was able to feel the healing hand of God and be released from the hospital bed, and now he's right here in the Lord's house. So we praise God for that. Just to give you a backdrop, I need to explain the passage that we're in. In the passage today, Paul is writing a mixed congregation of Jews and Gentiles, believers, uh, and he's telling them about the revelation of God's judging and saving righteousness in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so this church was established by, uh, by Hebrew believers, and uh, by the time of Paul's letter, they had become a well-known ministry. Salvation uh, is the general theme of Romans, uh, and it is, it, it is based on the concept, the theme of, 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 of righteousness of God. And so the structure of the letter, looking at all of Romans, the gospel, it starts off with the gospel as a revelation of God's righteousness in chapter 1. It goes a little further with the needs for salvation in chapters 1, 2, and 3. Chapter 3 through 5 talks about justification, and then sanctification is introduced in chapter 6 through 8. And then he confronts a problem in Israel based on their religious habits in chapter 9 through 11. He opens this particular chapter with the assumption of justification. You see in verse 1 it says, therefore being justified we have peace with God. It helps us to understand that when we are justified by God, now we are no longer in confrontation with God. Many of us who sit around hearing sermons and reading the Bible will often think that we've got to do something to be accepted by God because, because we know we're sinners. We know we're messed up. We know we're toe up from the flow up. But the reality is faith is what justifies us. If we believe that God loved us so much 
that he gave his only begotten son, that will put us in right standing with God. So here it is, uh, he, he, Paul is in a sense explaining that God loves us too much to let us stay where we are. Paul explains the benefits of justification. Justification brings us peace with God because our faith puts us in right standing with God. It also gives us access to God. Somebody say access. access. And it gives us a hope in the glory that is to come. You need to tell your neighbor, it's going to get much better than this. And then he gives us an idea of when hardship and trials come to us who are believers, it is not to kill us, it is to make us better. And so in a sense, we are strengthened uh -huh. by hardship. Yes, Paul then moves to, to uh, today's text to help us understand the love of God. He says, God demonstrated his love by imputing righteousness while we were still jacked up toe up from the flow up by sacrificing his son he died while we were while we had no strength uh -huh. we didn't have the strength to do anything that we were called to do and then he died while we were still sinners he fulfills the prophecy that the father gave in genesis chapter 3 verse 15 where he says and i will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed and it shall bruise your thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel in a sense we learn love from god through his sacrificial giving god's love is a massive and powerful but often missed by many expression of love we lack the understanding of this love because our perspective of love comes from a position of being in a fallen world. Somebody say, I live in a messed up world. Because you live in a messed up world, the best perspective that you could ever have on love, covenant, and relationship is broken at best. So how then do we find a better view of love? How do we find a better view of covenant? How do we find a better view of relationship? The only way you can find a better view of love, covenant, or relationship is to look to the one who is the master of relationships. And that is our Lord, our God. We are opening this series with a general discussion on relationship with God, but I can't have a relationship with God until I can relate to how he relates to me. Right. To love God or to have a relationship with God, you must consider the commitment. Yes, you got to consider the communication uh -huh. and you got to consider the covenant. Right, yes, but in order to do those things, we got to get some understanding. Tell somebody, I need to know something. And so here it is. We are all fallen people with a diminished understanding of covenant and love. Even our best attempt at relationships and love falls short of perfect love. 1 John 4.18 says, There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. The fear that accompanies the love that we have for each other is based on self-preservation. We want to preserve ourselves, therefore we have fear. Let me help you. Have you ever had a friend that you felt betrayed you because that friend didn't do what you thought that friend should do? And have you ever addressed someone else based on the fear of what somebody else did? That means that your love is imperfect. And the only way you can learn perfect love is to look to the one who came to us with love without any provocation. He came and he loved us in spite of us. So the only way we're going to know love is to learn love from God. Because God is love. First John 4 and 8 says, He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. My antithesis today presents the idea that it is evident that we lack an understanding of love. We break covenant with one another without fault. We say things like, uh, uh, I have very few, many acquaintances, but very few friends. That is a statement of fear. We embrace God from a perspective of convenience instead of covenant. 
We expect God to do all the sacrificing. We expect God to do all the giving. We expect God to do all the serving. And it is evident by our prayer lives. We go to God and our prayer life consists of, Lord, what are you going to hook me up with? We treat God like he is Santa Claus. We want him to check his list. Check it twice and find out who's naughty or nice. And that is not the God that I serve. I serve a God who is sovereign. I serve a God who will do what he wants to do, when he wants to, how he wants to. And this is why he declares that if I would simply seek him and his righteousness, all the stuff I'm begging for will be added to me. So there's no reason for me to beg for stuff because stuff will be added to those who seek after God. We are more dedicated to our traditions than true relationship with God. Knowing God, in order to have a relationship with God, we must first seek God through how he has revealed himself. He told us who he is. Can I part parenthetically because I'm losing three of you? I see you looking sideways. You're not paying attention. Here it is. Here's, have you ever been in a relationship and at the very beginning found out that the person you're in a relationship with had no idea who you were? And so what did you do? You spent time trying to help them see you and understand you. You were created in the image of God, in his likeness. You were created with his nature and his character. There are certain innate things that are in you that are just like your father in heaven. So because he wants a relationship with you, he also pre revealed himself progressively for over 6,000 years. He painted the picture. He made it clear so that you would have an idea of who he is. He showed us his eternity when he introduced himself as Yahweh. Yahweh, Vaheh. It is word that we interpret as I am. When he met Moses at the burning bush, he said, who do I tell them sent me? He says, tell them I am, which means that I can't put God in a box because he's too big. He's bigger than anything I can comprehend, which means that every time I look at him, he is an I am in my life. Now, I might think I need one thing, but the I am will give me what I need when I need it. The Bible says, and my God will supply all of your need according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. And so he is the great I am. I am your battle axe. I am your doctor. I am your judge. I am your counselor. I am all that you will ever need. And so you have to understand that he is eternally Yahweh, eternally I am. He is always everything that we will ever need at all times. But he, he presents himself in plurality. He says he presented himself in the beginning Elohim. We see that in Genesis 1. In the beginning, Elohim. Y'all stay with me now. Don't go to sleep. In the beginning, Elohim. Which shows us the plurality of God. When God spoke, he said, let us. Who was he speaking to? He was speaking to himself. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. God the Father eternally begat a son. And the begatting of the son never started and it never ended. So Jesus is eternally begotten by the Father. So when he spoke in the beginning, he spoke to his begotten. But his power manifests through his Holy Spirit. And his Holy Spirit didn't start. His Holy Spirit has always been. So when God spoke in the beginning, he spoke to all of himself. And when he said, let us, there was a full interaction of all of time with mankind. He is plural. He, I am. He's one God. Three persons. Not three gods like a lot of Muslims will try to make you believe. It's one God. Three persons. He's so much God that when he spoke, spoke became a person. He's so much God that when he spoke, power produced and power became a person. Let me change my theology in presenting that. He's so God, every time he speaks, what has always been spoken became a person or is a person, was a person, stays a person. That's why the person who had been spoken said before Abraham was, I, oh, y'all been reading too. 
So you got to understand the plurality of God. God is so good that he, the Father, saw that we needed to be redeemed. So he sent his word to redeem us, and he didn't leave us by ourselves. Jesus said, and lo, I'm with you always, even until the end of the ages. So when the son went away, he sent his comforter. And that's why we sing, I've got it, the Holy Ghost power. Now, do you want it? The Holy Ghost power. I need it. Somebody said, Bishop, that I want you to talk technically to me. No, I'm trying to show you something. You got to learn how to trust that God is with you at all times. Now, his, eterna his eternality, his plurality, he revealed his unity. Although there's three persons, there's still, this three is still one person. Three persons, one God. God the Father is not God the Son, but God the Son is God. God the Father is God. God the Son is not the Holy Spirit. God the Holy Spirit, but the Holy Spirit is God. In a sense, my head is not my hand, and my hand are not my feet. There's a clear distinction between my head, my hand, and my feet. But my head is my body. My hand is my body. My feet is my body. Although my hand is by itself, it is still one person. God is one person in three persons, one God. His eternity, his plurality, his unity, and his sovereignty. I don't care how much you pout, how much you complain that you don't see things happening in your life. He's still God. I don't care how good life is or how bad life is. He's still God. I don't care if your ancestors were slaves for 300 years, he's still God. I don't care if you're broke, busted, and disgusted, he's still God. He is sovereign. He will do whatever he wants to, when he wants to, how he wants to. And then finally he revealed his sacrificial nature and all of that that he is. He's still considered a no good, good for nothing, chocolate man with a white beard, and he knew he was toe up from the floor up, and he sent his son to die on my behalf. He died for my sins, past, present, and future. So when you got to when you got the nerve to point out what I didn't do right, I got the nerve to point out what God did right. Even when I don't do right for you, God did right for me. But don't look at me funny because God did right for you too. Okay, let me kick off. So when I know these things about God, it requires, it requires that I respond to what I know. Psalms 25 and 12 says, what man is he that feareth the Lord? Him shall he teach in the way that he shall choose. His soul shall dwell at ease and his seed shall inherit the earth. The secret of the Lord is with them that fear him, and he will show them his covenant. I'm afraid of the Lord. Now, when we say the word afraid, it is not the fear that causes you to resist, but it is the fear that causes you to embrace. This fear is a fear of morality, a moral consciousness of God. Having a fear of God is having a deep reverence for God, having a deep honor for God, keeping a deep respect for God. When I respond to God with fear and openness, he will give me secret counsel. The reason I know that my children are going to be successful is because the word told me that if I fear the Lord, my seed will inherit the earth. My daughter's here today. I ain't going to call her out, but I want you to know that she has inherited the earth because her daddy is focused on fearing the Lord. And the Bible says a good man leaves an inheritance for his children's children, children. Now, many of you think that the inheritance that you need to leave your children is money. But how many of you know that favor is bigger than money? If I've got favor, I've got everything else. Some of you think that you need a fat bank account, but what you need is favor. Favor will have you walking in doors that most folk can't get in. Favor will have you sitting with kings. Favor will have you doing exceedingly, abundantly, above all you have, think, or imagine. 
I ain't got the three minutes to give you the first point. And so I'm going to give you this first point in three minutes. Y'all pray for me. Maybe I give you part of the first point in three minutes. When we see how God loves us, we'll accept the sacrifice that he gave us in Jesus Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. And we will see it as proof of God's love. And that will position us in righteousness and the capability of seeing how to return love back to the Father. So I will not know love until I know it from the perspective of the Father. I cannot know the power that God has given me until I know who he is. And so the first thing I want to give you, what did God pro provide to reveal his feelings for us? I can't respond based on my feelings. I have to respond based on his feelings. The first thing God gave us was God proved his love so that we could love him. He proved his love so that we can love him. Uh, Y'all remember the song uh, from a long, long, time, long, long, long time ago. Is that the, the, the prophetess sing of giving <coughs> him something he can feel to let him know. Oh, y'all know the words, so don't look at me funny. You looking at me like I'm a I'm sacrilegious. No, you know the words too. So we listen to the same radio station. So in a sense, God gave us something that we could feel so that we would know that his love is real. Now, when I look at this particular text, I found this in Romans 5 and 8. But God commandeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Paul compares a divine love to human love. We love based on value. We sacrifice based on something of great value, but God loved us based on hope, according to Romans 8, 24, for we are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For what man seeth, why does he yet hope for? The word commended in the Greek means to put together by way of comparison or uh, by combinations, to teach by combining and comparing, hence to show or prove or establish or exhibit. So in a sense, God put together a combination that will reach back in the past, that will take care of the present, and will reach forward to the future and deal with all the sin that we've ever committed. In a sense, God taught us his love and validated that he loved us by giving his son so that all of our sins could be taken care of. He showed that true love requires a sacrifice. God made the first step by showing us that he was willing to pay the fee for sin. The power of what God did for us is this that we were saved from sin we are being saved from sin and we will be saved from sin while we were yet in pride jesus died for us while we were yet in greed jesus died for us while we were yet in lust jesus died for us while we were yet in envy jesus died for us while we were yet in gluttony jesus died for us while we were yet in wrath Jesus died for us while we were yet in cheating. Jesus died for us while we were yet in lying. Jesus died for us while we were yet sinners. He died. He died on a cross. And it was at the cross, at the cross where I first saw the love of God. And it was there by faith. I received my sight. And now, I'm happy all the day. You want deliverance, you want power, you want the presence of God, but you got to take his example. He didn't consider that you weren't acting out with love towards him. He only considered how much he loved you. And if you would recognize that God loves you just like you are, you'd be able to tap into the salvation power that he has for you. There's so much more that I want to give you, but I only had 20 minutes to put it out there. Is there anybody here that realized you said you love God, 
but there might be a chance that you've not given the same kind of sacrifice that he gave for you because the reality is many of us want to do what is convenient and not sacrifice Jesus said if any man wants to be my disciple let him deny himself that means you've got to ignore how you feel ignore what you want and prioritize what God says take up his cross that means I got to be willing to continuously suffer for God and follow me that means I've got to walk in what I've seen him do what did I see him do I saw him being taken advantage of I saw him being slapped in the face I saw him being rejected by religious entity I saw him but he still died for those who slapped him those who rejected him those who talked about him he still died for him do you have that kind of love this morning brothers and sisters as every man woman boy and girl stand to their feet I can't really connect one thing to you because there's so many more things that we've got to know but if you feel the way I felt when I was dealing with the, 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 the development of this message, I felt like I was unworthy. I felt like I couldn't believe that he would consider me righteous when I know he knows for a fact. He knows secrets about me that nobody knows. And he still said, I love you, son. Even though I wasn't ready to be a pastor, he said, son, my grace is sufficient. Now, if you're just feeling the weight of who you are and you feel like you need to connect with God in prayer, that's why I live a life of saying, Lord, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry because I know I'm not worthy. Now, if you are there, I want you to rush up to this altar. Don't even look at anybody. Just come on up to this altar. And in your confession, I believe God is going to release healing in this house right now. If you would just simply say, Lord, I'm sorry. If you know that you've come up short, just rush on up here. Just say, Lord, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Come on. 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 I need you to reflect. I need you to reflect. Go ahead and minister. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. This may be the last chance you'll ever have to come to the altar. Come on, my brother, come on. This may be the last chance you'll have to make a public confession before the Lord. And the Lord loves a confessing heart. The difference between Paul, uh, between Saul and David, Saul didn't sin as much as David, not according to scripture. But Saul never repented of his sins. And I believe every believer needs to understand the significance of repentance because some of the things that are going on in your life right now, I believe it is death that you've allowed to hold on to because you wouldn't repent. I dare you to just come boldly before the Lord and say, Father, I'm sorry for whatever I've done. Just rush on up to the altar. Rush on up to the altar. Just rush on up to the altar and just say, Father, I'm so sorry. As we continue in this service, the altar won't close, even though we will come to a close for the worship service, but the altar remains open. And the reason I do it this way, because sometimes people are afraid to come before the Lord while we're having service. But I'm telling you that your deliverance today is going to be based on obedience. You can't do it from your seat. You're going to have to come to the altar of the Lord because the altar of the Lord is where God's mercy is prevailing. That front position between the pulpit and the, and, the, and, the, and the people is what we call the mercy seat. Don't walk out until you come before the Lord and ask for forgiveness. With that said, let us go to the throne of grace and prayer. Father, I thank you for all that has transpired. I thank you for just calling us to be more like you while we were yet sinners while we were yet in our sin the Lord I realize that some of us don't even know what sin is so Lord reveal to us what sin is so that we'll understand what you've delivered us from because your word says all have sinned and come short of your glory so Lord as we prepare to leave this place but never your presence we ask for a continuous flow of your grace 
and the manifestation of the power of your sweet holy communion. Lord, let it rest, rule, and abide with us now, henceforth and forevermore. In Jesus' name, amen. Go in peace, and may the peace of God be with you. stop for all things MCOG. Follow all MCOG calendar events, listen to Merit Moments, Wisdom Wednesday, and Sermons, Tithes and Offering through Givelify, Sunday Resources and Prayer Request. Learn about us and how to locate us. Get the latest communication through email and text. Watch all services live. See member testimonials. Learn what we are about. See what we believe. Meet the leadership team. Church of Grovetown is a place where families can be educated, empowered, and equipped by the love of Jesus to be the hands and feet of Christ in our community. Located in the heart of Grovetown, we have the strengthening of families in our heart. From our fully staffed children's and students' ministry to powerful worship and impactful preaching and teaching, we believe you and your family will find meaningful ways to connect with our family and God. Worship with us in person or virtually at mcogfamily.org.